tonight as we're moving towards the end of this term and what a term it has been. Just so you know that the plan is after Bereshit, we're going to take a break over Shemot and restart again in Vayikra. So uh, we skip a book each time and then over the course of just over, just under two years, we finish the Torah and chasing lullabies. Just waiting for the live stream to finally begin. And we're live streaming. Great. Good evening. Welcome back to Chasing Lullabies. And we are coming towards the high point, the denouement of this term. And we really got to a place of interwoven complexity when it comes to the Torah and our understanding of what's going on. And um, I'm going to try and bring things together at least a little, a little bit more this evening. And so that we, in the final weeks, can finish off the entire picture. Just a reminder about, um, just a reminder of where we're up to. By the way, welcome to Tier 4. And I uh, hope everyone is well, keeping safe, keeping happy, keeping learning, keeping alive, and uh, keeping the fires lit. So, um just a reminder, our conceptual map of where we're up to so far and what we're going to therefore do this evening. I'm going to do quite a lot of just jumping into text. because We've got quite a lot to cover. Um, we're going to be looking at my notes over here on the other screen um, just to keep myself abreast of where we're up to. We'll do some screen shares. We're going to do some discussions. But today is going to be quite fast paced, hopefully not too much repetition from the last weeks. Quite a lot of new material, quite a lot of mind blowing links that we'll be sharing this evening. OK, so. Just to bring us back as to what we're doing tonight, we have our conceptual map that we saw over here. And I've added a tiny bit to the conceptual map just to fill out the gaps in terms of what we want to achieve tonight. So we've already said so far in our course over this term of Bereshit, like such a book to do, such so much there. We start off with Adam's world, one creation story, Noah's world, another creation story, Abraham's world, a third creation story. And we learned last week that we moved on to a fourth creation story in Jacob's world in the form of the Teraphim, in the form of those um, divining instruments, these things that could seemingly tell the future that Rachel stole from her father, Laban. Within Jacob's world, there were really three stories. So Jacob's world is expanded into three. There was the first Jacob story, which is Jacob and Esau, um, where Jacob deceives his father in order to wrest the blessings from his brother Esau, and that's Goats and Coats 1. We have another story which hears the echoes of Goats and Coats, that's Jacob's marriage to Rachel, and then we have the sort of dangerous finale of Jacob's world, which keeps things playing on in a groundhog-like day manner, groundhog day-like manner, whereby the same thing gets repeated and repeated until someone can redeem it. And so Jacob's world, which is the fourth creation story and the third world or the third part of the Jacob story, now is expanded into two different contexts. It's expanded into Joseph and his brothers. And we saw already goats and coats with Joseph and his brothers. Joseph had a coat. It was dipped into the blood of a goat and it was handed to the father saying, please recognize this. The same idea that uh, Jacob once put on a coat, Esau's coat, in order to deceive a father and say, recognize me. He didn't recognize him. He didn't know who he was. The coat of deception, and the uh, uh, which was experienced first in, in Goats and Coats 1, now came through to Goats and to Coats 2. But this week, we're not focusing on Joseph and his brothers. So that's going to be next week. This week, we're seeing the expansion of these three worlds in the world of Judah and Tamar. We're going to see a link between the world of Jacob and the world of Judah. And we're going to expand ourselves to Goats and Coach 3, which we've already started to see, and therefore we're not going to spend too much time on that. We're going to see that Jacob's marriage to Rachel is also found in the story of Judah and Tamar. And the Teraphim story is also found in the story of Judah and Tamar. And so the plan for tonight is to see the expansion of Jacob's world into Judah's world, to see these three parallels in the text, and then to try and understand how Judah makes a change. How does Judah stop Groundhog Day repeating itself once again? Okay. So we go, Canva, you're wonderful. So we go over to 
the Judah and Tamar story. And we're going to jump straight in. Um, 30 seconds reminder of the Judah and Tamar story. All of a sudden, we learn about Judah and Tamar in chapter 38. Judah has gone down from his brothers and has married a lady. They've had three children, Er, Onan, and Shelah. Er marries a lady called Tamar, and they don't have children. And Er seems to be um, doing something evil in the eyes of God. He dies. Tamar marries Onan in an act of Yibam to continue the legacy of her dead husband, Er. He's also wicked, and he dies. As a result of two sons dying at the hands of this lady, um, Judah withholds Shelah from Tamar, and Tamar takes matters into her own hands. She dresses up as a harlot on the road, seduces Judah, and conceives by him twins. Those twins will ultimately be the forebears of, of King David and Messiah, if only they will live. However, Judah condemns her to death on a result, as a result of the fact that he perceives her as having slept around. And indeed she has. The only problem is it was with him in order to perpetuate the line of her family, of their family. And so um, as she is being carried out to death, she holds up to this man, this judge, this ruler, Judah, who has given her his staff, his coat, his coat, and uh, his signet ring in collateral payment for the goat um, that was her fee. He, she told, holds it out and she says to the man who um, owns these items, that's the man for, with whom I conceive this, these children. And Judah says, Sad come in many, she's more righteous than me. And he admits to the fact that his involvement in he admits to his involvement with her. Okay, that is the 30 second recap. I hope it was 30 seconds recap of the Judah and Tamar story. And in it, we will find the redemption of all three parts of Jacob. We'll find redemption for Jacob and Esau, the goats and coats number one. We'll find redemption for Jacob and the difficulties in his marriage to Rachel. And we'll find redemption when it comes to the Teruthim story. And in so doing, we'll try and understand a little bit better why the Teruthim story really is another garden story, another garden of Eden story. And that's how we'll finish today. But as we have already asked, what on earth, what on earth is this story about Judah and Tamar doing in the Torah? There are many, many stories that never made it into the book. You know, like the backstory behind, um, the backstory behind Abraham, Abraham being thrown into the fiery furnace, Abraham having 10 tests. These are things that don't make it into the Torah itself. These are things that are in the Medrash. They're in the you know, associated oral tradition alongside the Torah, but they don't actually meet, make the cut of the Torah itself. What on earth is this passage doing in the Torah? And that's actually not only us who's asking this question, but if you have a look at this verse itself and you ask and you look at the one of the primary commentaries, which is Rashi. And he asks this question, why is this section placed here? What is going on? Why is the story of Judah and Tamar dealing, why is it interrupting the section dealing with the history of Joseph? Right, we we're right in the middle of Joseph and his brothers, and all of a sudden here comes Judah and Tamar. So Rashi says, from, based on the Medrash, to teach that his brothers degraded him from his high position. They lowered him down. It says, They lowered him down from his brothers. Why? When they saw their father's grief, they said, you told us to sell him. If you had told us to send him back to his father, we would have also obeyed you. Okay. Opening up to you straight away to our lovely Chasing Lullabies logger inners what do you find puzzling about this medrash they said the reason that the brothers lowered him down from his position is because when they saw their father's grief they said you told us to sell him it's your fault he's so sad if you told us to bring him back we'd have brought him back what do you find difficult about this medrash what's the seeming hypocrisy of the brother's statement Anyone wants to unmute, just unmute. You can hold the space bar. They were, the brothers were the ones who sold Benjamin. Sold Joseph, that's right. They sold oh, Joseph, Joseph. Sorry. Yeah, and, and what did they expect? Go on, they sold him. They they went along with this, but they, more than uh, They dipped the coat in 
goat's blood or whatever to show to the father to prove that he was dead knowing full well that he wasn't that they'd sold him into slavery right so they knew what they knew that and they but they also knew what else did they know this seemingly it sounds like they did it sounds like they were amazed by a certain response it sounds like they were amazed by a response that they could never have anticipated what was the response they're amazed at Joseph uh, Jacob's grief that's did right they expect him to be grieving for his lost son Exactly. I mean, this, that's the problem, Rena. When they saw their father's grief, when they saw the intensity of the father's grief, they said, you know, you told us to sell him. It was your fault, Dad, so upset. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Let's just work this one out. Um, guys, you framed the death of this son, of your father's son. You, you actually cre- you set this up. You knew that your father was going to believe that Joseph had died. What did you think was going to happen? You didn't think dad was going to be upset? You didn't think dad was going to be upset? By the way, where does the Medrash get this from? That it's because of the father's grief. It's because the verses just before, the verses just before seem to indicate something. The verses just before this chapter seem to tell us something about the grief. Jacob rips his clothes, and he puts sackcloth on his loins, and he mourns for his son for many, many days. And his sons and his daughters, they all got up to comfort him. But he withheld from being comforted. <coughs> He says, no, I will go down mourning to my son in Sha'ol. Sha'ol is another word for death, for hell. I'm going to go to hell mourning. I'm never going to, I'm just going to be caught in the depths of despair and darkness forever. And he cried for him. What happened that the brothers didn't think would happen? Was it that they were... um... Was it they were jealous of Joseph and they really wanted to get rid of him so they could get their father's love? That's what they were after. Right. But he wasn't interested in that. He was too consumed by grief to to replace them with Joseph. Right. So didn't they think didn't they think that he was going to be aggrieved at the loss of his son didn't they think that no, he would be- I, I think they thought he would forget about it after oh <laughs> that's what they thought they thought dad will be sad and then he'll get over it do you know what and we'll help him get over it all his sons all his daughters they all got up to try and comfort him and here's the big Here's, here's the punchline, the thing they weren't expecting, but he would not be comforted. Most people get over grief. In actual fact, from the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders, grief and depression for the first six months look exactly the same. But after six months, most people get over it. Jacob has a complex and extended grief response that tips him out of ordinary grieving and into what we might call a clinical depression, so much so that prophecy leaves him. This was the unexpected part, and we've spoken about this before. I said, when we were growing up, um, one of the charities that my primary school and one of the things that my primary school used to um, collect for and teach us about was, was Ron Arad. You know, Ron Arad, the parachuter who got lost over, Le- I think it was Lebanon, and they never found the body. Why is it that he will not be comforted? He will not be comforted because he can't go through ordinary grieving. You know, we'd, whenever I go to the grounds, I'm quite struck. I'm quite struck by the visceral nature of Jewish burial. It's very much... Um, it's very in your face on some level. We have, an, we have a simple box. In Israel, there isn't even a box. We have a simple box. You know, we're not, we don't have this sort of wake where there's this padded 
padded lined coffin where they all they get you get dressed up in your Shabbos finest and then they put rouge and makeup on the person's face to make it look like they're alive and then in a very sort of um, detached manner a button is placed as the coffin is slowly lowered into the ground and a little bit of astroturf is thrown on top that's not what we do we go we we squelch through the mud with this coffin which is a very basic coffin the person is wrapped in a talus or wrapped in shrouds and we throw mud and we throw earth on top of this box thud 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 it's a visceral experience it's an experience and why do we need it that's why it's so freeing because we are involved in the process of saying goodbye we are involved in the burial by the way i make it my business that any burial I'm at, I always make sure that the coffin is covered by Jewish people. That's what something, that's like, you know, final, final rights of a rabbi, final, final responsibility I can have for my flock is to make sure they have a Jewish burial, that it's not the necessary the non-Jewish ground staff that are putting in the actual covering of the coffin. That's what's going, that's, that's what my job is and anyone else who wants to help. There's no body here. There's no body here. There's no thud, thud, thud. There's no finality. There is an unending mourning. There's a complex grief reaction. And at this point, says the Medrash, the brothers already saw that this plan to get dad, to get over it, you know, and as Stephen says, to bring love from dad now to us, the remaining brothers, it's gone wrong. It's gone horribly wrong because he won't be comforted and look at this language by yome ki ered i will go down with my son down goes jacob and then by yered yehuda judah goes down the same language down goes jacob down goes judah because who was the mastermind of this plot who was the one that said let's get rid of him dad will get over it let's just sell him off that was judah and the brother said, look, you promised us that dad was going to be OK. He was going to get over it. He hasn't gotten over it. You made him go down. And so to speak, God says what goes around comes around. And OK, Judah, you've done this to your dad. Let's see how you deal with the same situation. And this is really the beginning of the whole piece. Now, the issue is, by the way, the issue is, is that if this is the rationale that Rashi gives as to why we talk about this here, why we talk about Judah going down, What's the problem with that answer? Rashi's told us the reason you have Judah and Tamar here is because, is because um, the, rab the brothers realized that he'd, he'd, he'd made a mistake with this plan to get dad to love them because the, he'd said dad will get over it. He doesn't get over it. And so the brothers um, make him go down from his exalted position of kingship among them. What's the problem with that explanation as to justify why we, have, why we have Judah and Tamar here? How can they understand the grief that their father's going to have? Um, last week, Chief Rabbi Mervis, he said, who lost uh, a, a daughter, said, you never forget you are always grieving and you can't say to people, you'll get over it. Is that Anthony? Hi, Anthony. Um, lovely to see you. Um, no one should ever have to bury a child I will I actually I've said that a number of times when I've been at the funeral or at the shiva for a parent who's had to bury a child whether that's an older parent burying an older child whether that's a parent burying a, a, a baby or a young person those are all unbelievable tragedies it's an unbelievable tragedy to have to bury a child at whatever age and anyone, anyone who's ever come close to that tragedy in any shape or form will be indelibly marked by that. It's difficult to carry on the next sentence. The next sentence though is that still people carry on, their lives carry on and they're able to live a whole wholesome, and happy life even with that pain even with that suffering so chief rabbi mervis isn't lying in bed in a depression at the moment neither is archbishop Welby. however jacob was jacob was in hell by his own account jacob couldn't experience happiness anymore 
So I agree with you that you never forget your loss. I'm not suggesting that you just move on and we're done. But most people are able to incorporate loss and pain into their life and life does carry on. You wear it with you. You wear the pain with you. I'm talking to a, a group of people. There's a lot of loss in this group, a lot of loss, but people walk along, people walk with it. They walk with the loss. It doesn't necessarily destroy them. It destroys Jacob. So that's what the brother said. The brother said, look, it's going to hurt him. It's going to hurt dad. But just like anybody else, you know, he will live on. And he didn't. He didn't. That's what the issue was. So, so, but that, that, that's, so that's the answer to you, Anthony. But I, the question is, what's the problem with Rashi? Rashi's um, um, justification for bringing in the Judah and Tamar story was because just as um, Jacob went down into the depths of despair, so too Judah was removed, went down from his high position amongst the brothers. What was the problem to justify the Judah and Tamar story? It's just a cold, not COVID. It's my third cold of the winter. Welcome back to <laughs> Um, I'll tell you what, Rashi's answer seems to only justify the first verse. It seems to justify why Judah was removed from his high position is because he'd been the mastermind of the previous of the previous episode. He'd been the mastermind of Jacob's depression, and so therefore his brothers blamed him and brought him down from his status. But that doesn't justify why you have the whole extended story of Judah, his daughter-in-law, her dressing up like a harlot, the whole thing. Why, why does that come about as well? And so the answer to the hypothesis, I want to right? that's the question. Okay, very nice that your, your first verse fits, but everything else doesn't seem to fit. Um, Judah, Judah also knew um, loss. Judah also knew loss. Well, he will know loss. Yeah. He will know it. So, so mum is also, also saying that Judah is going to know loss because he's going to lose his children. And actually, therefore, what, what you're really saying, mum, is say good, say better. Um, <laughs> what you're really saying is that Judah's story seems to match Jacob's story, that actually the entire process of Judah being brought down is not just in this moment that his brothers bring him down and say, you're no longer the ruler amongst us, but actually the entire account is going to be um, an account of how can Judah himself manage the same trials and tribulations that he's made his father endure. You, father, had to, in I caused you to endure loss. Now I'm going to have to endure loss. You, Father, have a challenge with this. Now I'm going to have to endure that challenge. And that seems to be, if we expand the explanation of Rashi to the whole, the whole passage, that seems to be what Rashi is telling us from, based on this Medrash. The Medrash is saying, and, and with Rashi's explanation, that the entire passage of Judah and Tamar is a passage of, of Judah having to deal and redeem with what he caused his father to be challenged with. His father didn't manage it. Maybe Judah can do it. Maybe Judah can work with loss. Maybe Judah can work with um, with Terafim. Maybe Judah can work with a marriage that is a tricky marriage. So that is, I think, therefore, we, now we set up the, the, the frame. Let's get, we, let's get, let's dive right in. And we're going to see that Judah is challenged with three different things. The first is goats and coats. The second is the marriage to Rachel. And the third is the Terafim. We've already seen the, the comparison of goats and coats in the Judah and Tamar story. And we've also seen how the goats and coats um, story comes about in the Joseph and brothers story. So I'm not going to repeat that now, just to, uh, but, but just a, a reminder of that slide that we had, where we had the two tracks. We had the Judah and Tamar track on the one hand, and we had the, we had the Judah and Tamar track on the one hand, and we had the Joseph and his brother brother's track on the other hand and we saw how um, once upon a time in a story involving goats and coats there lived a man in living uh, ex experiencing an unending mourning for a son that hadn't really died and um, owing to a lack of loyalty of one brother to the next who would not who would desperately hold on to his third son um, out of lack of loyalty can you hear me by the way tell me i've got some poor audio it's okay Shout if you can't hear. Out of a lack of loyalty from one brother to the next. And if only he would let go of his son to the Mars stranger, he would be able to bring back 
all the children reunite the family, but because he doesn't, the, sister, the situation is in deadlock until a masked stranger takes matters into their own hands. We saw that happen in the Joseph and his brother's story, whereby Joseph is sold into slavery. There's a man, Jacob, enduring an unending mourning owing to a lack of loyalty from one brother to the next. And there's a second brother taken away that Shimon has taken away. Why? Because Shimon should have supported Reuven, the oldest brother, right? The second oldest Shimon should have supported the oldest Reuven in protesting against the sale of Joseph. And he doesn't. And therefore he's put into prison as well. And now this masked stranger who has brought events um, to their head has asked for Benjamin, the third son, to be brought down to Egypt. And if Benjamin is let go, then we will get Joseph back because Joseph will reveal himself as the viceroy of Egypt. We will get Shimon back because he'll be released from prison and Benjamin will also be, got, will be returned to his father. And instead, because Benjamin is held back, so the entire situation um, cannot continue. However, we also saw that story in the case of Judah and Tamar. Once upon a time in a story involving goats because Tamar has as her feet a goat and coats because Judah offers up his royal coat, his staff and his signet ring as collateral payment for her fees of services rendered on the hilltop. And uh, there is a man in, uh, who is experiencing an unending mourning. Why is there an unending mourning? Well, Jacob's mourning was unending because there's no body. Judah's unending mourning is because there's no one who will continue the legacy of his son heir, of his son who died because he was wicked in the eyes of the Lord and did not um, appropriately consummate his marriage with Tamar. So he's waiting and he's he's lost another son as well because he's lost Onan, given in Yibam to Tamar. And Onan was also wicked in the eyes of the Lord. And he's holding back his third son, Shela, even though if he lets Shela go and then Shela conceives with Tamar. So um, so then Tamar will have a kid. That kid won't just be Shela's kid. It will be Onan's kid. It will be Er's kid. It will be all of the family of Judah incorporating this baby. And therefore a masked stranger, now Tamar, dresses up as a harlot and takes matters into her own hands and breaks that deadlock. OK, so we've seen Gates and Coates. Goats and Coates seems to replay in the Judah and Tamar story. But what's the difference? The difference is, or we'll see in a second. OK, but there will be a difference because the Judah and Tamar story will end in something quite courageous. Whereas, and that courage that Judah has in the Judah and Tamar story will then be transferred back, will then be transferred back into the Jacob and brothers and Joseph and his brother's story. So. We've dealt with story number one, the goats and coats story, because we saw goats and coats right back in Joseph when Jacob and Esau. Jacob deceives his father by wearing a coat and being asked and, and, and noticing and, 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 and fooling him, fooling his father not to recognize him. So we've seen goats and coats one. We've seen goats and coats two. We've seen goats and coats three. Now. We have to see the Rachel marriage story, that there were the other, the second great challenge that Jacob faces, and therefore the second great challenge that Judah has to redeem, if he is going to have to really, if he's going to really take on all the challenges of, 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 of father, he's going to have to also redeem, he's going to have to redeem the story of Jacob meeting Rachel. And I just want to make a point, there really are, because we're now going to look into the text and we're going to find amazing amazing comparisons we've already seen amazing comparisons between the, the goats and coat stories next comparison another mind-blowing comparison is the comparison between the jacob meets rachel stories and the judah and tamar stories but in order to do that i just need us to, to sort of stand back for a second and say there are actually two jacob meets rachel stories the first one's obvious is when jacob meets rachel um, but what's the second one when else is there a tension around the marriage between jacob and rachel does anyone Anyone want to suggest something? When else is there a tension around the marriage between Jacob and Rachel? Well, she, she can't have children, can she, to start with? Well, she can't have children, that's true, that's true. Um, I'm thinking more about how the marriage is set up. Meaning, um, the marriage initially is, is challenged because Joseph, just because, because Jacob, the, the marriage initially is challenged because Jacob has no, has no money. The Eliphaz, Esau's son, has stolen all his money. He comes penniless to Laban, and Laban takes advantage of him. When are Laban and Jacob negotiating over this marriage? It's at the beginning when he says, I have worked for you for seven years, but when else are they negotiating? When he gets the after wrong one. 
has to marry Ray, uh, Leah. Jonathan? No. He um, when, he discovers, when, he discover, when he discovers that it's not Rachel who he married, but Leah. Okay, so that, that's true that there's a, that Michael and Jonathan are answering the same answer, um, that it's, it's only a little bit later on that uh, he realizes that he's, there's been the old switcheroo. And that might come into it, but there's another time that there's a negotiation over this marriage, this arrangement that they've set up. It's later on. It's not a sheep, is it? It's the sheep. <laughs> Fantastic, Stephen. It's the sheep. At the end of 20 years of service, at this point, um, Joseph, sorry, I'm keeping getting my Joseph, my Jacobs mixed up. If I'm getting it mixed up, okay, I'm getting sure everyone else is going to get them mixed up. So um, at the end of the 20 years of service, Jacob has worked for his father-in-law for 20 years. He says, Nakfa schacha elai the eterno. There's a language there of nakva schacha elai, put your, put your wages on me or name your wages and I will give it to you. There's this interesting episode where Joseph, I keep on doing it, where Jacob wants to leave, where Jacob wants to leave his father-in-law Laban. And he says, look, I've done this for 20 years. I've done, I've, I've worked for you for 20 years. I need, I need something to show for it. And Laban says, well, Put your put your wages upon me, and I'll give them to you. It's an interesting language. Nakva, uh, a point, or literally, it's more like put a hole, put a fixing of your wages. But nakva can also be read nakeva, nakeva meaning a lady. Put your ladies on me. It's almost like they're arguing about the daughters again. They're arguing about whose whose property, for want of a better word, I know it's a horrible way to describe it, but Who's in charge of these women? This Rachel and this Leah. Laban says, Nakva You want to start talking about the girls again? I mean, they're not, they're not really yours. And in actual fact, when Laban catches up with Jacob and they have a conversation, Laban says, This is all mine. Look at all this. Look at everything you've got. It's all mine. What do you mean it's all mine? Surely, Jacob, that's your wife? Those are your kids? No, says Laban. We never made the deal like that. You said you were going to work for seven years for me. I didn't accept that that was going to cause a transfer. There seems to be a debate around who, um, who's in charge, right? Is it the conglomerate of Laban? Or is it, or is it no, that Jacob has been actually been able to earn something? And this is, by the way, this is where we get into the speckled sheep and the, um, the spotted sheep, because even though there's a herd, which is genetically predisposed not to have speckled and spotted sheep because all of them are removed. All the parents are gone. All of this, that's what happens, that they remove all the speckled and spotted sheep and all of a sudden, because of the, the different divination um, tricks that he puts in the, in the troughs of water and food, so then, then we get lots of speckled and spotted sheep. It's almost like saying the parents are gone and now they're mine. That's quite a symbolic gesture on Jacob's part. Jacob says, I've taken away the parents and they're still mine. I'll take away you, Laban. You're the parent of these women who are my wives. They're mine. They're not part of Laban conglomerate. You've ever wondered, by the way, why the Haggadah says um, Laban was worse than, than Pharaoh. Laban wanted to uproot everything. I don't see Laban walking around with a sniper rifle trying to knock off the house of Jacob, whereas Pharaoh was going around killing little baby boys, all the Jewish boys. Why are you comparing Laban to Pharaoh? The answer is Laban didn't want to kill everybody. He just wanted to absorb everybody, to assimilate everybody. Nothing was outside of the corporation of Laban. Everything was mine. It's all mine, says Laban. It's like those villains at the end. It's all mine. It's all mine. You know, and, and, and that's where he loses it. He loses it because he is trying to take control so therefore there are two different parts of the torah we're going to compare to judah and tamar both of them talking about jacob's um negotiations and trickiness in taking on his wives as his own the first is at the beginning as we mentioned where jacob initially negotiates despite being penniless to work for his wives for seven years but then the, the last part is when he's leaving and he's trying to also see some benefit from this Okay, so here we go. Um, let's do some text, and we're going to jump back into Genesis 38. We are now moving on to 
the, we're still in the Judah and Tamar story. And what we're now going to look at is we've done the introduction and saw how the introduction has goats and coats. And we're going to see how it, this story progresses to not only hold goats and coats, but also to have within it echoes of the negotiations between Rachel, between Jacob and Laban for Rachel and for Leah. There are going to be, I think, six different comparisons that we'll find between this text over here, Judah and Tamar, and the negotiations for Rachel and the marriage of Rachel to Jacob. So let's start. Verse 13. And it was told to Tamar, saying, Behold, your father-in-law is coming, is coming to Timna for the sheep shearing. This is her opportunity to seduce him on the way. This word, Vayugad, and she takes off her, her clothes of mourning and she covers herself uh, with a veil. It's interesting. She covers herself with a veil. And she sits at literally, what does petach enayim mean? She takes, she sits at the opening of the eyes. It means over here, the context means she sits at the crossroads, but she sits at the opening of the eyes. It's interesting. Because she has seen that Shayla has grown up and she has not been given to him for a wife. So she covers her face, implying that she can't see. But actually, then she sits at the place of the open eyes and she sees something very clearly. She can see something that Judah can't. She can see what Judah can't see because he can't see her. Why? Because he thinks that she is a prostitute. He can't see, but she can see. She can see the truth, even though her eyes are covered. By the way, just out of interest, first comparison between this story and the previous story man is meeting a woman and the woman is dressed up so you couldn't really see the woman and you wouldn't really know who she is jacob and Le uh, jacob and leah and rachel that's right thanks rena that's the first comparison all of a sudden right what happened leah was dressed up in rachel's clothes she's given the wedding dress She's taken to his chamber and she knows she can see. Jacob can't see. Jacob can't see who's under the veil. She knows who's under the veil. All of a sudden, though, we're having a comparison. It's a resonance of Jacob's marriage. But here it's not a resonance of Jacob's marriage to Rachel. It's a resonance of Jacob's marriage to Leah. OK, that's interesting. Let's keep that in mind. But let's carry on for a second. Sorry for uh, the very explicit language, but he says to her, let me sleep with you. What does that remind you of? What does that remind you of? That language, I want, let me, let me sleep with you. So it reminds you of the language that Jacob says to oh. his heart. Go on. It's nothing to do with Joseph and Potiphar's wife. No, it's, oh, that's an interesting similarity, and we will see that next week. But in this, this we're trying to connect back to Jacob. So when Jacob is, has finished his seven years of service for Laban, he says to his father, he says, Hava et ishti, give me my wife, aleha, and I will be with her. He's like It's very explicit, and the sages are not quite happy about the way he presents it. Um, he, but... Um, I think it's Genesis 31. Do I'm not going to do it right now? But uh, so the second comparison is that the language of give me her so I can be with her. And that's the language that Judah uses to preposition what he perceives as a harlot on the on the wayside. It's actually the same language that Jacob uses when he just talk, talks to his father-in-law saying, right, seven years of up, time to be with my wife. However, now that's Jacob meeting Rachel. That's not Jacob meeting Leah. So comparison one has been Jacob meeting Leah because of the closed, hidden nature. Comparison two has been Jacob meeting Rachel. Let's keep that in mind. It turns out, it seems, that uh, whilst Judah is playing Jacob, Tamar seems to be playing both Leah and Tamar. She's a dual personality in this. Okay. Um, then Tamar says, she says, Matitienli, what will you give to me? Kita if you want to have relations with me. What are you going to give to me? Matitienli. Have we ever heard a ma 
T10 Li. It turns out that we have heard of Ma T10 Li. When there are Ma T10 Li, when Jacob is negotiating with Laban at the end of their time together, this time um, Laban says to Jacob, what can I possibly give you? What can I possibly give you? I was to try and... Um, here we are. I think it's verse 31. What should I give you? So the same language. She said, What will you give to me? Laban has said to Jacob, What can I give to you? So that's comparison number three. Let me show you a couple more parallels. Jacob says in Genesis 30, verse 30, he says, Ki ma'at. For the little that you had before I came, has burst forth, has burst forth to a huge amount. Where else do we have the word bursting forth, yifrotes, in the Judah and Tamar story? What does that remind you of, yifrotes, bursting forth? So I'll give you a clue. Tamar has two two sons. What's one son called? One son's called Zerach, which means the shining one. What's the second son called? Peretz. Peretz, bursting forth. Why? Because he's the one who puts his hand out first. Puts his hand out first. He bursts forth. But you throw the rope. So, so comparison number four is by you throw the rope. There's a, there's this bursting forth that is expressed both in the description of how Jacob has served Laban, also in the description of Judah's son, Peretz. Fifth comparison. Fifth comparison. Joseph, J Jacob says to his, Joseph, Jacob says to his father-in-law, he says, Vahayos um, Chari, I'm going to tell you that my Reward will come in the future. My reward will come in the future. On the on the reward that will come in the future. Okay. Meaning there's no sheep now. There will be sheep in the future once the speckled and spotted ones have come about in the flock. What does that remind you of? of? There's no sheep right now. There'll be a sheep in the future or a goat in the future. Well, that's a gift that Judah's going to give to Tamar when he gets home. That's right. That's the well, it's not a gift, it's a payment. But yes, it's okay. a payment that uh, that Judah will, he's not going to give the goat now. There's no sheep now. There will be sheep in the future. That's comparison number five. And finally, finally comparison number six. Um, so after we talk about um, this future, says Jacob to his father in law, he says, the answer beats it kasi In the future, when you go over my wages, beats it kasi. Let my honesty toward you testify for me. So let my honesty, let my righteousness come before you. This language of my righteousness. Now, by the way, can I ask, was it very righteous what Jacob did with the uh, the sticks and the this and the that? Was that a righteousness there? Not so sure. So where was the righteousness? Where does the righteousness finally find itself? Have you ever seen in the Judah and Tamar story any reference to righteousness? Oh. So when he ends up with him. That's right. He says, Zadkat me many. When he owns up that it was him, he says, she is more righteous than me. Where is it? Zadkat me many. She's more righteous than me. Same language. And finally, there is righteousness there that he owns up to his involvement. Okay, so six comparisons, six different textual links and thematic links between the marriage of Jacob to his wives and the situation going on with Judah and Tamar. It's just interesting, though. Is it Rachel or is it Leah? And on a very deep level, it's really both. Meaning... The tragedy of 
Jacob's married life is that he has to split his love between two women, two families, two sets of sons. His, his father, and this is already the echoes of goats and coats, number one, where Laban says back to his son-in-law, he says, Lo um, we don't do this in our place to do the younger one before the older one. You, you might have stolen the blessings. You're the younger one taking in front of the old one. In our place, we don't do that. That's not appropriate, according to us. And so that's the tragedy of Rachel and Leah and Jacob, that there's a split in that home. How can we relive those events in a redemptive way? The only way we can relive those events in a redemptive way is if the same lady can become both Rachel and Leah at the same time. Because this woman is both. How is this woman both Rachel and Leah? Not just textually, but conceptually. Let's think about it. Judah had two wives. One passed away and the other one was Tamar. She becomes his new wife when they have relations. That's what actually happens with Yibam, is that they become man and wife. Tamar's first wife, her line, sorry, not Tamar's first wife, Judah's first wife, who is the mother of Er, Onan, and Shelah. So her line will end, essentially, because, in a sense, her sons haven't had any kids. What does Tamar do? Tamar, by marrying Judah, is keeping alive and being the second wife, the, an, a loved wife, like uh, Rachel is the second wife. But Rachel's children are not, not Leah's children. Here, Tamar's children are wife number one's children. She's brought together Rachel and Leah by offering up her children as substitutes, as Yibam, for first wife's sons. She has become a, a, a sort of a, a rapprochement between Rachel and Leah, because it's like she, the second wife, like a mini Rachel, has served the needs of the first wife, has served the needs of Leah. Which means that therefore Peretz, her son, is the child of two mothers. She's their biological child of Tamar, but she's the Yibam child of Judah's first wife as well. Tamar is acting in the role of Rachel as also having a child for Leah. Okay. So we've now looked at the comparison, how Judah can redeem goats and coats. We'll get there in a second. How Judah can redeem the marriage between or Tamar can redeem the marriage between Jacob and Rachel and Jacob and Leah. But what about that third comparison? How do we see the Teraphim story? How do we see the Garden of Eden story in the Judah and Tamar? What are the resonances there? And once again, we have about six different textual comparisons, seven different textual comparisons between the Judah and Tamar story and the Teraphim story. But just before we do that, a quick analysis over here. A quick analysis. In the original Teraphim story, who are the key players? Who are the key players in the Teraphim story? Just remind ourselves the Teraphim story that Laban, uh, sorry, that J J Jacob and his wives and Hoff and family have run away from Laban. Rachel has stolen the teraphim. These are divining instruments, the mystic ball of mystic, the crystal ball of mystic neg. She's stolen these teraphim and Laban runs after them, says, why are you leaving? I wanted to kiss my children. I wanted to look after you and bless you. And we saw all the echoes of previous stories in that episode. And he searches for these teraphim and there's a death sentence pronounced by Jacob on anyone who's stolen them. And Rachel says, I can't get up because I'm having my period. So I can't get up and she's sitting on these teraphim. Who are the key players? There are three key players in that story. That's Rachel. Yeah, Rachel. Laban. Laban and? 
Rachel? Sure. And maybe Jacob. There's Rachel, there's Laban, and there's Jacob. So we have, what's the relationship between Rachel and Jacob? Husband and wife. What's the relationship between um, Rachel and Laban? Father and daughter. and daughter. Father and child. What's the relationship between Laban and, and Jacob? Father-in-law and son-in-law. Okay, great. Who are the key players in the Judah and Tamar story? There's only two. There's only Judah and Tamar. How old in the second? What's the relationship between Judah and Tamar? Daughter. Wow, both. Daughter. Wife and daughter-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. She's both, she's both daughter-in-law because she's married his sons, but she's also wife because in Yibun, once relations happen, you're married. So actually, the two protagonists in the Judah and Tamar story really mirror the three protagonists wow. in the Jacob in the Jacob, I mean, one, in one we've got daughter-in-law, the other one we've got son-in-law. Right, we have, we have parent and, well, father-in-law, daughter-in-law, father-in-law, son-in-law. We have in-laws, a vertical relationship, and we have a horizontal relationship of husband and wife. And those, those, both those dynamics, nor, those dynamics play out in, with three people in the Laban, Jacob, Rachel, Teraphim story, and they play out with two people who occupy two different relationships at the same time with Judah and Tamar. With that in mind, we can now we could now get involved into the textual similarities between the two. Okay. First similarity, first thematic connection. There's a woman who's taken things belonging to her father or father-in-law in the story of Rachel and Laban. Rachel has taken her father's teraphim, his divining instruments. Do we have a parallel in the story of Judah and Tamar? He's ta she's taken his uh, staff and coat. She's taken his signs of, of royalty. She's taken his staff, his signet ring, and his uh, his cloak. By the way, what do these things represent? Staff, signet ring, and cloak. Identity. Prince. Which identity? He's a prince, wasn't he? King. That's right. Prince, king. He's they. they it's his royal. It's his royal identity, and he's been able to. He's given them up. What does that show you about his relationship to these things? He's had enough. He doesn't care. I have to think about that because in, in his regaining of these items, when he owns up, he doesn't just regain a, a piece of clothing, he regains royalty as well. And he becomes really the head of the divinic line. But that's the first com combination. The first comparison is that a child has stolen, has taken something from a parent like figure. Rachel has taken the trophy of dad. Jude, uh, Tamara has taken the staff, the signet the ring and coat of father-in-law. Next. Um, she didn't but, take them, did she? She earned them. Well, she, well okay. <laughs> she, she didn't pinch them. No, but she's withholding them. Well, she doesn't give them back. She doesn't wait for her goat to come back, does she? So she's withholding <laughs> them at some level. Um, so, um, Vayugad, Vayugad. So now we've uh, gone through the, they've had their relations together, and she has conceived. <laughs> And it was told, it was told, Vayugad li Yehuda Lamor. It was told to Yehuda saying that your daughter in law has had illicit relations and she has conceived. That's an interesting form, Vayugad. It's a Pu'al form. It's a very strange grammatical form. Is there any other time that someone is told Vayugad in this form? We have that before. We had that before. Where do we have that before? It's yeah. told to Laban that your that his son-in-law has run away. Just going to find it over here. Here we go. A little bit further on, chapter thirty-one. I can't see it. One second. There's one twenty, is it? No, it's not. It's not. No, no. no. Okay. 
By you got the love on verse 22. By you got the love on by Yema Shrishiki Barach Yaakov. It was told in that very interesting form. It was told passively. This is this. I think this is the only time it appears in the whole book of Bereshit. It is these two times. Um, so I think, as far as I'm aware, this this language of by you got it was told. So first connection, child stealing something or keeping something, withholding something from parent. Second connection, the language of by you got it was told. Third connection. How many times does um, Lavan? How many times does Lavan search for his idols? And it's told Velo Matza, and he can't find them for his trophim, and he says that he can't find them. So let's have a look. How many times does he does he search and say Velo Matza, and he can't find them? So Vayavo Lavan Ba'el Yaakov Ba'el Leha Ba'el Shleha Mahos. He goes into the tent of Jacob, the tent of Leah, and the tent of the two maidservants. Velo Matza. So one time, Vayetzel Velo Matza. He can't find them. Um, then Rachel's tent. Varach al Lachas Atrafim Tazmi Bechar Gamav Teshav Leim Yimashes Lavan. It's called Velo Matza. He looks in front of the whole tent of Rachel. Velo Matza. That's a Second time, and then she says, "Don't don't get angry. I can't get up because I'm having a period." and he searches velo matza esatrafim. He can't find the trafim. So three times he searched and he hasn't found. Who else searches three times and can't find? Go back to the Judah and Tamar story, and there was this prostitute on the on the on the road, and she took away his coat and his staff and his signet ring, and they want to find her so that they can give the goat and get back the get back the goods. So she's looking that her his Judah sends off his servant. He sends his uh, the, the the goat in the hands. To, to take off the collateral below Matza, he can't find her. One, where is she? And they say, she's not here. I didn't find her. Two, and the people they and the people they of the place they also say that they could that she wasn't there. And Judah says, let her keep them. Then I've given up on those items. Why? Because I don't want to be embarrassed. But Ata Lomat Sasa and you did not find her three. You didn't find her. Three times the Tarafim were searched for and not found. Three times the harlot wasn't found. That's comparison number three. Next. In both cases, we had a child taking from a father, but in both cases, the husband doesn't know. The husband doesn't know. In the case of Rachel and Jacob. Rachel doesn't tell Jacob that she's taken the trophim. And if only she would have take, told him. If only she would have told him, so then he wouldn't have made that curse. In the, the story of Judah and Tamar, does husband know? Does husband know what daughter-in-law has taken? No. No, because Judah is husband, meaning he's father of this child, and he doesn't know he's father of this child, and he only sees. That he and he doesn't know that daughter-in-law has taken these things because here daughter-in-law husband and 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 wife are the same. So in both cases, there's a situation where the father-in-law does not know, but also where wife hasn't told husband. That's comparison number four. Comparison number five. What's going to happen? What does Jacob condemn his wife to? Because of this lack of knowing. Die. To die. Right. What does what does Judah condemn his wife to because of a lack yeah, of Yeah, the same. Pain? Yeah, yeah. To die. Yeah, you're gonna die. You're gonna burn you. Comparison number five. Comparison number six. What would happen if indeed Rachel will die? That all not only will Rachel die, but messianic he, period won't begin with David. That's right. Well, if Rachel's gonna die, we're gonna lose Joseph. We're going to lose Benjamin. We're going to lose the messianic line of Joseph. If Judas, and as you say, as you say, Francis, what's going to happen if Tamar dies? Not only will Tamar die, but her children will die. Peretz will die. Zerach will die. If Peretz dies, then the Davidic line is going to die as well. So comparison number six is that unwittingly the curse 
of killing the wife is not just a curse of the wife dying, but it's a curse of my entire lineage dying. And comparison number seven is, it's an, it's an odd comparison. It's the opposite comparison. You know, we talked about the idea of binary, whereby you have a, you have a textual parallel, but it's the opposite. What does Rachel say is the reason that she can't get up, the reason that she can't share her terafim, her taken items with her father-in-law? She says, because I'm having a period. What's the reason that Tamar is willing to offer up the stolen items to her father-in-law? It's because she's not having a period. It's because she's pregnant. This is the final comparison, but it's the opposite comparison. There is a moment here whereby there is a redemption because here there is a final owning up to a situation. The Teratim story has rehappened, but at the end, both characters have saved the woman from death by owning up to the truth in a radical kind of way. Tamar has owned up to the truth by owning up to the dual role that she shares. She is, yes, she's daughter and all, but she's also wife. And she owns up to that by holding out these items and saying to the man, whose these are I conceived by. Judah also owns up and says that she's offering up the opportunity to share something different, to share a pregnancy rather than sharing a period. And Judah at this point in time, Judah is willing to take on the mantle and accept responsibility for this, for this, for what has happened. He's willing to say, I'm not just father-in-law anymore. I am also husband. And this is the redemption because Judah becomes Judah. What does Judah mean? Judah means to admit or to thank. They're the same word in Hebrew. To admit something is to thank. Why are they the same word? The answer is, is that when I thank someone, I rebalance a imbalance in my relationship. Someone does me a favor. It's an unbelievable favor. How can I repay it? I need to repay it. There's a compulsion to repay it because there's an imbalance in my relationship now. I owe you. The only way I can, I can repay you is either by actually doing the thing back for you or by saying thank you. Similarly, when someone's hurt me or I've hurt them, the way I can rebalance that relationship is by saying, sorry. Judah is the one who's able to live by his name and rebalance the relationship by saying, Tzad Kamameni, she's more righteous than me. This is my child. And so it's radical truth telling that forms the redemptive nature of this moment. And it's lying and the opposite of truth telling the opposite of holding responsibility that has been the hallmark of the garden story. What was the real tragedy of the Garden of Eden? And we talked about this at the very end of yesterday, last week, and we're going to just finish off with this today. What's the real tragedy of the garden story? The real tragedy of the garden story is that no one's willing to fess up and take responsibility. Adam says, it wasn't me, it was Chava, it was Eve. Eve says, it wasn't me, it was the snake. Everyone's passing the buck from one to the other. It's the same thing in the Rachel story. She's not willing to speak up. There was a moment where she says, where she could have said, you know what? I took the trophy. I did something wrong. I'll take responsibility. Yes, I'm having my period. Yes, I can't get up, but we can transform this. We can transform this into a, a moment of truth telling. Sorry, dad, here they are. And she doesn't. It's the trophy story. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the garden story. Once again, we won't take responsibility. Rather, we're going to think instead about what we need in that moment. And we already explained what does Rachel think she needs. Rachel thinks she needs to protect the legacy of her, of her husband by taking away the mystic ball so that Laban won't take advantage of them. It's about my needs, my honor, rather than about what's right, what is right and what is true. And that's where we come back finally to the garden. The garden story was a shift from a world of true and false to a world of good and bad. We talked about the Porsche in the middle of the night. What I convince myself is good is not necessarily true. You might think about it like this. Some societies are built on honor and shame. Other societies are built on integrity and guilt. Honor and shame is, and honor and shame is where it's about, can this action support my name, my honor, my role? Integrity is, is this action right? Now, often the two are synonymous. You do something which is special in the world. It's right. And because it's right, you get honor. So therefore, they are consistent. But at times, they move apart from each other. Does owning up from Judah's perspective, does being a Judah, does that offer him honor? No. 
it denigrates him in the eyes of, of all. Is it right? Yes, it's a world of integrity. That is the great redemption that Judah brings. He is able to own up, to be a Judah, to really recognize his role, to radically tell the truth. And so he breaks down that cycle, that cycle that we saw repeated throughout Jacob's life into, and, and now he has to repeat in his life. He's able to live up to the challenge. So he's able to live up to it in his life. Will he be able to take those lessons and express them also in the lives of his brothers as they go down to Egypt? For that, you'll have to come back next week to Chasing Lullabies. Thank you very much for Chasing Lullabies away with me this evening. Log in next week. Can I, can I just... An ultimate session. Yes. All questions 